Hello, thank you all for waiting so patiently. It's uh, one minute past. I think we said in the chat we started two past, so I think we're starting early. Chris, uh, if you can hear me and maybe say hello. Yeah, I am, I'm here. Fantastic, great. We were trying to uh, do the very best we can to replicate a real world, real room, face to face environment. So as you were all joining the room, Chris and I were, if you like, sort of sitting on the stage, having a, a conversation by Skype rather than in person. Lovely to see the chat so active. Um, we will ask you to use that with a bit of discipline later on, but for now, feel free to, to say hello, say where you're from. Great to see we've got people from India. I think we might have people tuning in at a really anti-social hour, maybe even from Australia. And I know we've got a few from the Americas as well. So great, thank you all so much for your warmth and welcome. So um, if possible, please show your full name uh, so that we can get a feel for who you are when you say hello in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, it's a little more pleasant than Sophie's iPhone, so. Um, it looks like we're not sharing cameras, so don't worry about putting yourself on full view. And um, if you can avoid using the Q&A for now, that would be appreciated. We're all physics teachers here, probably all IB physics teachers, and we're really hoping to get a nice community vibe going. So prepare to share um, to as, as much as taking back. Now we're going to give you your first little um, challenge, as it were. If you click on the participant section of Zoom, you should find that you're able to raise your hand. And if you can see the panellists, I've just raised my hand. And excellent, I can see some hands coming up from the floor. Let's see if we can get halfway. Excellent. Great, so we know what we're doing with the hands. If everybody could now switch their hand off, lower their hand. Very well behaved, great. Please raise your hand if you are in your first or second year of teaching IB physics. Oh, so quarter of the room, that's incredible. Uh, I read off to you guys because it's a tough year to be an IB physics teacher, what with all the changes to coursework and exams. So well done you. Um, hands down. Hands up now if you would consider yourself a real beginner in distance learning, if the last few months have been the first time you've ever really had to go at a distance. Oh wow, almost the whole room, okay. So you're in the right place, Chris is gonna um, sort us all out later on. Who is here because they'd like ideas for day-to-day -day teaching and learning at a distance? Okay, great. Uh, and we've, we've given the right agenda, Chris. And who is here because they want some IA or extended essay ideas for the home or online? Okay, great. slightly less. Thank you so much for uh, your participation there. Um, so before we kick into the main um, emphasis of this, meeting. I've got a few challenges for you. You see we've got 104 people here. If even a third of us felt able to share something with the group and it strikes Chris and I that we could do something really quite powerful which is to share our ideas. So those ideas could be the best distance learning strategy you've tried so far. The distance learning strategy you'd most like to try, like an ambition. And an IA that you've had a student do in the past or that they're doing right now or that you've got an idea for where students could do that from home. I'm going to use two locations for this. First is the In Thinking website. So I'm just going to share screen with you for a moment. 
So if you're a subscriber, you'll know this web page, this home page quite well. When you're logged in and you click on the latest update of the webinar today blog, you'll see that the comments area is enabled. And thank you very much, Colin, already populated your challenge. The questions are here if you need a reminder. And this blog will stay live. This will be a repository that you can return back to, hopefully, with 30, 40, 70, 80 ideas from the participants in the webinar today. And the other location from which you can share your ideas is the chat. So this is the point at which we'd like to say, as much as we, we appreciate your warmth and your, your sort of hello, this point on, it would be lovely if you could answer the three questions that I have just given in the chat. So I'm just going to copy this right now for you to refer to. You don't need to answer all three. Multiple ideas. <coughs> Please do share all of them. And hopefully, as a room, as a community, we can all leave with not just ideas from me and Chris, but from maybe a few dozen. It's about time that we allow Chris to introduce himself. So, Chris, are you ready to say hello and what brings us here today? Yeah. Hi, everyone. As you, am, I on, am I on the screen now? I can't see anything. On screen, yes. Okay, okay. Hi, I, I'm, as some of you know, Chris Hamper. A lot of familiar names in the list there, but a lot I don't know. So I should introduce myself and say something about myself. I've been teaching for 40 years, but after 35 years of teaching physics, I no longer need to think of what to say or even think what students might say. I knew what they'd say, so I could answer before they even asked. A true lord of the board, armed with a repertoire of well tried jokes, plenty of tricks up my sleeve. Five years ago, I got Parkinson's disease. Lord of the board, no more. Time goes remarkably fast when you have a degenerative illness. I need to act quickly or retire from teaching. I'd always liked the idea of student-centred learning, but it takes so long to prepare the resources. A year of early mornings, and I had the whole course covered. Over 100 lessons, including observations, practical work, simulations, extension work, problems, multiple choice questions and tests. I'm still at the front of the class, but sitting, not standing. Students come in and get out their laptops and start work. I wait for questions and if I feel like it, add, some, add a bit of TOK. We cover the whole course without a single lecture. Students like physics, some get sevens. About five each year choose to write an EE. Some think it's weird. They all think I'm weird, but weird in a good way. So I've been teaching online for years. When I went into isolation, my students hardly noticed the difference. Now they're at home, it's business as usual. In some ways, it's easier for them to ask questions online than it is in class. In this webinar, Emma is going to give you a guided tour of both Think and Study IB. And if I can work out how this all works, I'll try to answer some of your questions. Okay. And back to you. Oh, um, yes, I'm just to add my own introduction. My name's Emma. I live in London and being a reasonably densely populated city, my Wi-Fi is only so good, so I'm so sorry if the sound is here and there. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky because uh, the very first workshop that I ever attended was under Chris. It was on use of ICT in physics teaching. That was back in, I think, 2006 or, or uh, 16 or 17. And since then, uh, Chris has really kindly got me involved in supporting him in running some of his workshops. Uh, I, we can recognise some of the names. It's great to see you all here. And I've also had the pleasure and the privilege of helping him to co-author and co-curate his websites for the last couple of years as well. So thank you all for having me. So we've got quite a lot on the go. We've got our chat already up and running. I'm just going to recopy the challenge questions for you, for anyone who'd like to respond to those already. Or you can respond in the blog comments, which will save us a bit of a copy and paste job afterwards. And we're now going to take the unusual move of showing you a video. 
The reason for this is that the video covers about 30 minutes of content, if it were live, in the space of about nine minutes. It's got tons of visuals to show you what we mean, which means that we don't need to have so much open on our laptops. And it has the very, very significant benefit that it means you can get the conversation starting with Chris almost immediately. Chris, as I'm sure you can understand given his introduction, didn't want to be fielding questions verbally and reading at the same time. So while the video is playing, what I'd really invite you to do is to start using the Q&A. Think of this as being like a physics workshop. Imagine that we were putting on a video live in the room for you to watch and think of the Q&A as being a place for you to stick some questions, a bit like calling Chris or I over in the room and asking us what we think of your idea. So without much further ado, I'm going to share the video with you. If we have quality issues, I'll show you once again where you can find it. Also stored in the ib.net slash physics website, the blog webinar today, and you can click to play it here. So if my screen share fails, you will probably have much better internet connectivity in comparison with me. So please feel free to meet us back here at the webinar in 10 minutes after the video has played because you can watch it from the comfort of your own internet connection right here. Chris, is there anything else I need to say before we go to the video? No, I think that's it. Great, I'll get it on. Uh, thanks all in advance for watching for the next nine to 10 minutes. See you here then. In this video, me and Chris are going to share what we've been up to with our classes while our schools have been closed, and we'll suggest what you can do to engage your IB diploma physicists from afar. Now in my everyday teaching, I'm guilty of being a lord of the board. I often stand at the front of my lab asking questions, giving task instructions and making live notes for my students to follow. My whole school IB coordinator role has made me complacent in lesson planning and my students would be lost if I was lifted out of the classroom. Now working from home, I'd evaluate my teaching and learning so far as being responsive and ad hoc. I've been trying to maintain the same teacher-centered environment, even making my first podcast to give students a screen break. But with reluctance to give myself up completely to independent learning, and automated quizzes. Chris, on the other hand, has been unknowingly preparing for distance learning for years. His web-based Think IB course is well-balanced, carefully curated, relevant and fun for students, and matched perfectly to IB requirements. It's not a textbook, nor should it be. Study IB is the place to go for notes. Instead, it's founded on activities that take the teacher and their students from lesson conception to completion, from planning to assessment. It took us just three days to convert the existing materials into an online course with modifications for doing it at home. The structure of a complete online activity commences with an observation or stimulus, carefully defining the quantities or terms to be used, an experiment or simulation, applications and examples in the real world, problems for students to solve, and a mechanism to assess understanding. It's good practice to get metacognitive, sharing your medium-term thinking with your students about what, when, and how they're learning. We love FET, Paul Falstad, and other simulations for showing what should happen according to the theory. But when it comes to experiments in the subject guide or the IA, simulations are too perfect. It'd be like doing a teacher demo in the classroom 
and then having the students take their turn on the same kit. Instead, we endorse modelling tools where students construct their own apparatus and make active decisions. Excel can be used for modelling, as can Algodoo and GeoGebra. Of these, Algodoo is probably the most attractive and it can be modified to match reality or the textbook assumptions. It's easy for students to change parameters like gravitational field strength and in doing so reveals the physics rather than hiding it. Clone hundreds of elastic particles with no intermolecular forces under a piston to make your own ideal gas. Make a momentum cart using light wheels and axles. Use a rope and oscillator to investigate harmonics in standing waves. Cut glass to produce lenses of whatever refractive index you desire. Or make a container of water to observe floating and sinking. GeoGebra kicks off with more of a blank canvas in which students use mathematics to construct the physics. All of Chris's GeoGebra simulations are available free, but they're at their best when part of an activity, such as these instructions on how students can build their own space-time diagrams. It's not intuitive, so be prepared to take time to support your students' development with scaffolds. In time, they'll come to realise that GeoGebra might be just the means to answer their questions, such as about 3D polarisation or the phase differences in pendulum waves. Now to hands-on experiments and IAs. Practical work in the home can often present more challenges than it would in the lab, but then challenges can be a good thing. Practical work should reflect not just what is supposed to happen, but what does happen and our goal as teachers should be to facilitate explanation rather than accuracy. We know that a consideration of types of error and quantitative analysis of uncertainties are required to score well in the IA and the extended essay. What better way to achieve this than to use equipment that isn't quite fit for purpose? Think about coins instead of masses an oven's thermostat instead of a water bath, multiple cells instead of a variable power supply, and even the tongue as a qualitative voltmeter. Think too about proportional quantities that might act as proxies for the variable of interest, such as depth in a swimming pool deep end for pressure. It might be helpful to start with an object you're curious about. Decide the variables you'd like to measure and then forage for a means to do so. I've had students investigate Stokes's law with plasticine, parabolic mirror reflection in a toy miroscope, and cycling aerodynamics with a hairdryer and anemometer. Provided that there's a theoretical framework to verify and a link to the course, you're on the right track. Check out our mini IA to get your DP1 students started through a low-stakes investigative process. Remember that there are apps and software available for students to download free, such as Audacity for pitch and volume of sound waves, Tracker for motion analysis and videos, and the SparkVu app by Pasco for discovering the accelerometer and light sensor already built into your mobile phone. It's possible for IB physicists to use databases as the foundation of their investigation. NASA, geological surveys, and citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo may make data available upon request. But this isn't an avenue we would promote to our own students, not least because the very term database could refer to anything from a shopping list to Amazon's customer records. And as a more serious example, there's little originality in using data of recessional velocity and distance from the Earth to verify Hubble's law. So as we can see, getting distance learning right takes careful design to be engaging and comprehensive. The good news is that you needn't look far to find activities spanning the full course to immerse your students in IB physics. Think IB is for teachers. 
set up a student group and the next term's work in the space of a few minutes, and use our author quizzes and gradebook to track how everyone progresses. This frees you up to give individuals support as needed through your school's preferred online conferencing tool. Study IB is for students. They can create their own accounts to revise from notes, videos, flashcards and questions. The virtual tutor walks students through difficult problems using a network of hints for the ultimate in differentiation. Our videos explain concepts in the stages needed to solve problems, and we've written some original past papers with fully explained mark schemes. Students can even download the app for practice on the move. Whether you use Think IB, Study IB, or your own materials, we hope you now feel inspired to take your teaching at a distance to the next level with activities, modeling, and hands-on investigations. I'm back. Chris, are you? Yeah, I, just un I just unmute myself. Great, great. <coughs> well, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. I, mean, I have no idea. I was just watching myself on screen for nine minutes. Let's just give 30 seconds for those who have gone via the link to come back to us, um, and it'll give me a moment to see how the Q&A is looking. I think we can assume that everyone who's coming back to us is coming back. Um, so thanks everybody for the questions that you've been submitting so far. And thank you to anybody who has been answering the challenges. So we're almost up to 10 responses now on the blog. So thank you very much for those. We're going to go to a more traditional webinar format. Chris and I are going to stay live and we would love to get a feel for your reflections and questions. So you can now make the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, I will pick out some questions for us to answer live and Chris is going to uh, give us thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll pick out one, Colin Cuthbert's question. Yep. Does it does the time commitment to make animations or learning to make animations take? Does it take a lot of time? It takes an incredible amount of time. Some of those animations take three days to make. But uh, you have to think think of it as a hobby. Would you say it's um, an advantage to have your students learning to do their own GeoGebra? And Algadu. I think GeoGebra, they get to a certain level. They never get to the point of making some of those really difficult ones, but some of them get into it. So I think it's, I, I think it's worth the effort, but you, you can get a bit addicted to it after a while. So you have to be careful. Um, let's take some of Patrick's questions here. What are you, what's your school doing for things like webinars within your school? My school's using Microsoft Teams. Is your school doing something like that? We're using Zoom and, uh, well, I say we, they are using Zoom and, and Hangouts. I've not been really doing webinars at school because uh, I prefer to, to answer individual students' questions using Hangouts or Zoom. I've not been doing any, uh, any sort of class time, as it were. So students have been doing assignments and I've been checking up on them and, and having individual sessions. But, Do you want um, to say a bit about how you talk, communicate with students during their IAs? Yeah, during their IAs, all, all via Google Classroom. I, 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 I either use the chat on the, on the document or leaving comments. There's a lot of communication between uh, before the, the first draft stage. Uh, after the first draft is pretty much over. 
there's um of people chris recommending firefox the app is that something you've used what's that fire firefox oh no no i've not, I've not tried it I'm not, much a phone person. I'm not much of a phone person my phone doesn't really work properly <laughs> the only reason that if you're wondering why i chose to show spark view in the video rather than any other app it's because back when i learned with chris about ict in the sixth classroom he actually had a representative there from pasco do you remember chris yeah he gives and, me lots he gives me lots of stuff so maybe we're a little biased um but thank you for the recommendation to everybody who has um come up with that one now Chris, we had a few questions in advance of the webinar and um, by email from those who perhaps couldn't make it about the extended essay. Do you want to say anything about doing the extended essay remotely? I mean, extended essay is, is pretty much always remotely. So I, uh, because often students are doing them in their, in their summer holiday. The difficulty now I can see is that uh, when students are doing everything remotely, it becomes very difficult for them to actually have time to do their extended essay as well. Whereas before, the, the extended essay was the only thing they had to do in, the, in, their, in their spare time, as it were. Now everything's sort of overlapping. But so we're just starting the extended essay process with our first year students, and so uh, we'll see how it goes. But I'm recommending things that we've done it at home, of course. Although some of our students are still at school, can't go home. Yes, those ones who can't travel away from. Um, some people have been curious about the group four project is that something you've run remotely chris i i, I we have cancelled ours I, i've never tried i've tried to uh, do it remotely a couple of times but it's not really very successful I, I would i would advise leaving it till they're all together again because it's a good it's a good opportunity to do something together this year we're going to make solar solar farms out of little mirrors and that's a little bit difficult to do it on different sides of the world. So it's... I uh... decided at, at my school to postpone the Group 4 project. Yeah, it's, I, think, I, think, it's I think that's the best this, thing. Yeah, it, for our students, it's pretty much their favourite day or two days of the year. So we wouldn't want to take that opportunity away from them. And what about the... So Chris, you are a very strong proponent of doing the physics IA in the last term of the first year and it's a strategy that I've since adopted as well because it doesn't clash too much with other subjects. But there are some people here who might be doing the IA much later in the course. What topics do you think would be best for people to teach at a distance? while they're getting through their schemes of work in the absence of the IA? Uh, I'd say just continue in your normal, in the normal way you would normally do it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just continuing as, as normal. I think, I think that the IA, from my experience of just uh, having just done the IA at a distance, it's, uh, it works really well. And it's because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an activity where the students have something to do, they, they have concrete goals, they they have re something re they're doing something real, and the feedback I've had from students was that it's the best experience, the best on uh, remote experience they've had. It was the one subject where they really knew what they were doing, and they felt that they actually achieved something, as opposed to some other subjects where they they're sort of drifting a bit. So mm. I think uh, I think it's a very good uh, opportunity to try something, and there's no problem about doing the experiments at home. I mean, there's stacks of stuff they can do at home. Mm -hmm. Just to I can see a few people are um, needing to go for various reasons, just to give you a bit of a heads up, we will start to wrap up this or we'll conclude in about 10 minutes. So if you've got any other burning questions, please do pop them on the Q&A and we'll see what we can get through. Um, I can answer one very functional question, which uh, came in from Lorena. Thank you for that. Study IB is absolutely for students. They get their own account, they log in personally, and their teacher can't track what they're doing at all. So it's very much the onus on the students and trust in them. At the moment, it's free, 
So um, have your students snap it up while they can. Normally it's a 50 euro subscription per student and because they pay that themselves, we, we know that that doesn't therefore mean an investment for the school. So that's what we, is the, that's how we manage that. And think IB, yes, for teachers. You can use that with your students. You can set tasks, you can monitor how they're doing, you can have quizzes which are automatically marked. And Think IB is the main mechanism through which I teach, and it's the sole mechanism really through which Chris teaches. I like to think there's a little trick in the names S for study and for students, C e for Think IB and for teachers. Now, so how many of your students in the past have done IAs or extended essays with data that they collected either from a model or using a database? Do you have any advice there for people in the current context? Uh, none from database. Uh, some from basic models, but normally they do, they do some sort of experiment first. Like they may be using a model to model a golf ball, but they also go and hit some golf balls too. So I'm very much into modeling things, modeling things rather than the model being the thing in itself. So, yeah. But lots, lots of my students use modeling on top of uh, an actual experiment just to give a bit of depth. So it works really well. I think um, some of my students have even used simulations like FET, which we know work beautifully and elegantly and perfectly every time, as long as they've done it alongside the, a real experiment to provide a basis on which to discuss the quality of the results. Ms. Blatt has asked GeoGebra and which other tool? That was Algodoo. How did you find out? How did you find out about Algodoo? Who, me? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember actually. I've used these for years and years. Must have Googled it. So. Thanks, Chris. Some of the, Mart is asking how I actually deliver the lesson. Hmm. I, mean, I simply set it up on the on in thinking uh, uh, um, student. Uh, what do you call it? Student. Oh, student access on Think IB. Yes, student access. Student access. And I, <laughs> I set them uh, an, act, an assignment for the week, uh, and I set uh, put it up a discussion forum. So they asked me questions in the discussion forum. I set up a uh, multiple choice quiz that they do after the, after the activity, after the assignment, and then some uh, problems to do at the end. So it's all, it's all via the, uh, the uh, student access on in thinking. Uh, I, I just uh, answer questions and if, if students isn't doing anything, I contact them through uh, Google Hangouts. The Website designers recently came up with a new feature where you can set an assignment direct from the page as well. So once you've got a class group set up on Think IB, go to the page that you like and you can set it direct from there. You don't have to return to the group to set it. Chris, with Pro, um, maybe not available for students now that schools are closed. What are you going to be recommending for students when it comes to uncertainties, lines of best and worst fit, and that sort of thing? I mean, the uncertainty is that they have to either repeat measurements and get a spread of data, or they just have to uh, approximate. It's pretty much the same as with, with any equipment. You either make an approximation uh, and in fact, the uncertainties are going to be much bigger now. Uh, it can be a problem getting, getting uh, the, the uncertainties down to a reasonable level, but um, it's, uh, I, 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 see, I don't see it as being so different. And if a student was using, let's say, Algodoo for their main, the main experiment aspect of their work, how would they estimate the size of the uncertainties? I'm just answering Smith's question here. It depends on what they're doing. I, I don't. I think when, when using Algodoo and things like that, I think it you can't really bring uncertainties in. So maybe it's not really relevant anymore. 
But uh, that's why I always like them to do something where they're doing an actual experiment. So you can talk about the uncertainties there and then, and then the, al the algorithm part where they, in a way, ignore the uncertainties. Because they, they are, there are programmed in uncertainties. Uh, uh, particles jump out of boxes and things like this. But uh, they're all programmed in, so it's a little bit fake. Mm -hmm. I'll take your question about setting structured questions. And Marta, this feeds in with yours as well. Unfortunately, Think IB at present doesn't enable you to have questions interspersed throughout an activity. And so unless they're multiple choice quiz questions. Now you can use Think IB to set discussion tasks, in which case students get access to a forum that's connected to a page. And you can set written tasks in which you ask a question or series of questions and students have a free text box in which to respond. But unfortunately, we don't yet have the functionality within our site to enable you to set sort of automatic marking of structured questions. Um, but thank you for the idea. And it's definitely something our developers are looking at further student access and its functionality. Is there anything that catches your eye at the moment? Something about from Ralph about uh, do, what do I do if students make sure students uh, Ralph Tickler to make sure students uh, have a have a, a theory behind their, their experiment. But in the early stages of the IA, I, I always make sure that they can uh, get an equation based on their on their knowledge, their present knowledge. It doesn't have to be correct, but it has to be a correct application of what they know. Uh, I, I give them quite a bit of help at this stage because I think that it's, it's a very good part of the learning process. But uh, yeah, if they don't, and if they don't get an equation, they need to really think again, because it's very difficult. If they if they really want to continue, they can, but it's very difficult to score well if you don't have a prediction. Yeah. Asking how um, how you're doing assessments online. At my school, we're actually using. Um, Microsoft uh, forms for some of our assessments. So um, across all of the full physics department at my school, we teach everything from UK Key Stage 3 right through to GCSEs and IGCSEs and then the IB and other sixth form curricula as well. <coughs> and where there would normally be exam weeks, me and my colleagues have been converting the papers that we would have used into Microsoft Forms, uh, which teachers can then duplicate and set for their classes. Chris, has your school gone through an exam period since the school closures? Or if it did, what would you be using? I'm not sure at the moment. I mean, at the moment, I'm much more interested in, in engagement rather than, rather than performance. I want to see the students engaged. I want to see them doing stuff. I don't care what their marks are. I just want to see what, that they're actually doing something. Uh, of course, they, they need to, if their marks are bad, they need to think about uh, why they're doing it. But I think when it comes to the exam, I, I, I think I'm just going to trust my students and uh, give them an exam. And if they cheat on it, they cheat on it. But that's very much my uh, take on it. There are probably not many schools where you could get away with that. And I suppose, Chris, we're nearing the end now. Perhaps I'll ask you the same three questions that I set as today's challenge for the community. This might prompt those who've yet to have a go to write their challenge answers in the chat or in the comments to the blog where we've now, I'm pleased to say, got over 10 responses. We'll collate all of the responses together, everyone, so hopefully we'll end up with a nice bank to choose from. But Chris, what's your favourite or most effective distance learning strategy been so far? I think definitely the IA. It's, it's uh, it made me feel <laughs> with the IA that you feeling you feel part of the part of the learning process, totally involved with the students as they move from stage to stage. Um, I tried getting my second year students to go through the uh, activities on on options, but it didn't really go anywhere. And now they, know, now they don't have an exam, but the IA was a really, really good experience. Yeah. 
Um, what would you most like to try? Is there anything you've not used yet that you will be having a go at over the next few months? Uh, well, I, I've, now I've tried a webinar. I think I've got, done them all. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. Have you done a podcast? I'm very proud of my podcast. No, no podcast. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that too then. And um, I don't know, what would you, if you had to come up with an IA on the spot right now, one that maybe one of your students is doing, what would it be? I guess it'd be something like uh, the, the, the student in, uh, in, Af in uh, somewhere in Africa, I'm not quite sure where he is, I think Senegal or somewhere, somewhere who, who went home and, and his IA wouldn't work anymore. So we got, we got the idea of the old classic bouncing a football. But uh, because you can't measure the pressure, you can measure the pressure by sitting on the ball and seeing how much it squashes and then measure how far it bounces. So he's measuring pressure by proxy. But so so the, the research question is, what is the ratio between squashiness and bounciness? So I quite like that one. Of course, he, he will have a proper research question in the end. Uh, um, thanks, Chris. I will address a few of the last few questions that have come in over the last minute or two, which all link, I think, ultimately to the title of this particular webinar about engaging students through distance learning. And the comments that are coming through are, at the moment, seem to be about testing and about assessing engagement. Now, my school is incredibly traditional. We do topic tests and we do whole cohort exams. So we're going to be doing those as best we can in the usual way. I've been literally sending Word, doc Word documents of um, the tests that my school uses to my students and they're responding with um, the answers filled in. Um, and for engagement, I'm checking in with my students almost daily using Microsoft Teams and the chat functionality there. Chris, you don't actually test um, sort of in big sort of chunks. I think I'm right in saying you test le every lesson. Yeah, that's how I use it. I, I'm not going to be bothering doing that for the time being. I think, I think uh, I'm just going to use the multiple choice quizzes on, in, on the in Thinking website and that will be enough because uh, the, the, the whole point of, the, of the, uh, the small test was to make sure that when they came to class, they remembered something from the class before. Whereas now we've dissolved class in a way, it's more of an ongoing process rather than a, rather than a class by class. So it's a little bit of a different, uh, different thing. We will, we will have the end of year exam, I suppose, at some point. Um, I'm sure we'll think of a, a way of doing that. Yeah, great. Well, Chris, um, I'm sort of getting ready to wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to say about the webinar or anything else that um, has come to mind? I, I mean, I, I'm just, uh, being my first webinar, it's been quite uh, nerve wracking, I must admit. Yeah. But uh, it's been very difficult to, to, to keep track of all the questions going on. And I can see lots of questions that I, I could answer, but of course we don't have time. But is there a possibility to answer them after the webinar is over? Or do they all disappear? Well, once the webinar is over, and I'll say this to everybody in the room, we can stay oh, online. Still there? Oh, everyone's still here. I'm joking. Um, uh, we can stick around, Chris, and have a look at what questions we haven't answered yet. And we will make a point of trying to address the big themes of questions in our summary of the webinar, which will be sent to you probably by a combination of the email that you used to sign in today and the blog post. I've been referring back to. So what we'd now sort of like to ask is that if you could please do add your ideas to the comments under the blog, any that have appeared in the chat I will take note of and add them to the blog as well with credit if I can. Um, we've covered a lot, everything from some nitty-gritty of which modelling tools versus simulations to, I suppose, setting and assessing work, and also just some big ideas about teaching and learning. Um, are you enjoying distance learning, Chris? Distance teaching? Am I enjoying distance teaching? Yeah. Um, 
I must admit I prefer to, to meet people in the classroom. Any, living in Norway, where I live, there's not really many, many, very many people. The only time I meet anyone is when I go into the class. So it's getting a bit lonely. Um, and yeah, I think that says it all. We can't wait to get back to face-to-face -face teaching with our classes as soon as we can, but also to hopefully have opportunities to meet the visitors to this webinar face-to-face -face once again, if the opportunity should arise at um, other In Thinking conferences. <coughs> um, so to round up, we will share absolutely everything from the presentation that we possibly can on the blog and by email that includes the slides. Um, we will wrap up all of your ideas and squash them together in the comments. And we will also try to answer any unanswered questions for you as well. To all of our In Thinking subscribers, I feel a bit like EasyJet now. A special thank you to you and speak soon. You guys don't need to worry if we don't answer your question because you have 24 seven access to us via the site. And Chris is amazing. He'll get back to you within a few days at most, if not on the day. And to those who don't currently subscribe, it's free. So please do, um, and that's for all, all um, webinar attendees if your school is closed. So please do check out the trial on Think IB and Study IB if you haven't already. That's it from us. Stay well, have a great day, and bye for now. Bye. So what happens now? We just